Good evening, good evening, everyone. Pray that uh, you all have had a a great weekend and a great first day of the week this Monday. Give me just a second here. Write a couple people, and then we'll we'll dive into the chapter tonight and get started. Right, um, again, again, good evening, everyone. Good evening, good evening. Um, Miss Angela, good to see you on. Miss Keisha, good to see you. And what's up, Mr. Uh, Kennard Vernon Stewart? Good to see you on tonight, man. Um, so um, tonight we're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 16. And y'all, this, um, this roller coaster of events um, dealing with these kings is about to get very interesting. Um, and I believe we, we started seeing this trend ever since Solomon died <clears throat> a couple chapters ago. Now we are, um, now we're starting to see kind of the ups and downs of, of the kingship in, um, the land of Israel. Now that the two tribes have split up or the 12 tribes have split up rather, um, Judah is now separate from Israel, all this stuff. So it's going to be a really interesting week as we continue to, uh, to walk through this book. So uh, I want to give a quick shout out to everybody to the Suicide Squad, Angela, Marcus, Brenton. Uh, appreciate you guys, um, what you what you all brought to the table last week. And I'm definitely looking forward to what we've got coming this week. If you guys saw the post that I put out um, last night, we're going to be doing some collaboration sessions uh, this week. So you'll see two of us on at one time um, covering a chapter. And so um, that's going to be really fun, too. So um Without delaying the time any further, let's go ahead and jump into 1 Kings uh, chapter 16. So in, in um, 1 Kings chapter 15, when we left off, uh, we left off at the very end of that chapter dealing with a guy named um, Baasha. And he was, <clears throat> he was like a, one of the commanders um, in the army of Israel. So I actually want to back up to verse 32 of chapter 15, uh, and then it kind of just rolls into chapter 16. So verse 32 of chapter 15 says, there was constant war between King Asa of Judah and King Baasha of Israel. Baasha, son of Ahijah, began to rule over all Israel in the third year of King Asa's reign in Judah. Baasha reigned in Tirzah 24 years, but he did what was evil in the Lord's sight and followed the example of Jeroboam continuing the sins that Jeroboam had led Israel to commit. And we're going to see that a lot, um, especially in this chapter tonight. And, and it really speaks to um, the influences that you're around, right? Um, because you're going to see Jeroboam's name brought up quite a few times, um, even with other people, right? Other people will continue to follow this example that Jeroboam has set in. And, and as I continue to see the repetition of this, it just reminded me of how important it is that people don't follow our example. And let me let me clarify what I mean by that is because we may have a lot of good ideas. We may have a lot of great intentions, um, but it's most important that people see Christ through us and they follow that example versus following us um, doing our own thing. Right. Uh, because we were flawed, we make mistakes, and uh, especially when we are just doing our own thing outside of um, the will of God, it could cause other people to look at our lives. And because we have the, we claim the title of um, a Christian or a Christ follower, a believer, they could look at us and say, oh man, they're a believer, but yet they're doing this. So that means I could do this. Right. And so then they begin to follow our example when we're following our flesh and then it causes them to stumble. It causes them to sin. And Paul was very clear when he wrote in the New Testament about not about us as believers, not causing other people to stumble. And so that's why it's very important to make sure that we are living a life that is surrendered completely 
to the will of God, to what he wants to do in our lives. Because again, in another part of the New Testament, Paul writes, and he says that we are not our own. We've been bought with a price. So the life that we now have because of Jesus Christ, it still doesn't belong to us, right? Our, our responsibility is to live in obedience and into complete submission to his will so that Christ can express his life through us so that people are not drawn to us, but people are drawn to him. And so uh, I thought that was very, very interesting just seeing all this back and forth with these kings. But let's go ahead and move on down into chapter 16. So it says, hey, Miss, uh, Miss C, good to see you on. Miss Jill, good to see you on as well. So uh, verse one of chapter 16 says, this message from the Lord was delivered to King Baasha by the prophet Jehu, son of Hanani. It says, I lifted you out of the dust to make you ruler of my people Israel, but you have followed the evil example of Jeroboam. You have provoked my anger by causing my people Israel to sin. So now I will destroy you and your family, just as I destroyed the descendants of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. The members of Baasha's family who die in the city will be eaten by dogs, and those who die in the field will be eaten by vultures. Then it says the rest of the events of Baasha's reign and the extent of his power are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. When Baasha died, he was buried in, the, in, Tir, in Tirzah. Then his son Eli became the next king. And so uh, it's really interesting here. What's up, Kenzie? Good to see you on um, with us tonight. So check it out. So on the one hand, with with Baasha, you see that we see that God um, used him to accomplish His will in dealing with Jeroboam, right? Because we know what Jeroboam did, and um, Baasha ends up killing Jeroboam. We saw that in the last chapter, right? And through Baasha doing that, it fulfilled what God said was going to happen to Jeroboam, right? Jeroboam uh, caused the people of Israel to sin. And so now here comes Baasha and he takes care of it, right? But what's interesting about this, because I'm, I'm about to read a verse in a second and it, and it kind of threw me for a loop when I read it because here Baasha is doing or fulfilling through his actions, he's fulfilling God's will, what God had spoken. But on the same token, He's fixing to be held accountable for what he did. And when you first look at that, you're like, well, how does that make sense? He's doing God's will. But here's the thing. God never forces himself on anybody. He never forces his will on anybody, right? He allows situations to unfold. And then he allows people to make their own decisions. And it just so happens that when people make certain decisions, it just falls in line with what he already has planned. But again, I want to make it clear because a lot of people argue the point that God is just a dictator. God forces people to do these things. He forces people to do that. God's unjust. Why is he holding people accountable for doing this, doing this, doing this when it's a part of his will? Again, it's not because he's forcing anybody. He's giving everybody the choice to make a decision. And based on the decision you make, depends on whether you're held accountable or not. So it's really interesting. So check this out. It says the message from the Lord against Baasha and his family came through the prophet Jehu, son of Hanani. It was delivered because Baasha had done what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as the family of Jeroboam had done. And also because Baasha had destroyed the family of Jeroboam. The Lord's anger was provoked by Baasha's sin. You know, it's really interesting to me because um, what we're going to see tonight is we're going to see people that do not learn from other people's mistakes, right? Um, I've heard it all the time growing up to pay attention, right? To people, observe what goes on, right? When you see somebody go through a situation, um, you know, whether it, a bad situation or whatever, pay attention so that you don't have to make the same mistakes that they did in order to learn the same lesson, right? A lot of, a lot of tragedy, a lot of heartache, a lot of a lot of foolishness can be avoided if we would just open our eyes and pay more attention to what, what's going on around us, right? Um, I remember, you know, I've heard it from my grandfather and others, you know, hey, I want you to make sure that you're, you're paying attention because I don't want you to make the same decision that I made, right? I don't want you to have to struggle like I did um, because 
of a certain decision, right? And that helped me because I would 100% rather just watch somebody else, you know what I'm saying, learn from them. That way, they don't have, I don't have to go through the same thing they did. Same thing with my boys. I'm going to teach my boys, right, from the decisions that I made. That's why it's very important to be upfront and to be honest, right, with your children. Because I mentioned it on last week, mentioned it again this week. Asaph wrote in Psalm uh, 78 that we will not hide these truths from our children, right? And he, if you read the whole 78th Psalm, he talks there in the beginning um, about within the first six or seven verses so that the next generation would know who God is, right? They would, be, they would learn to put their trust in him. However, he goes on after that and continues for several, several verses about just letting the, the next generation in on the bad decisions that, that Israel made, right? And why is that important? It's important so that here they are, they're given the history of, hey, these people made these bad decisions. This is what happened to them. So now knowing that this is the consequence for this specific decision, it will give them insight to where they say, oh, you know what? I don't want to make that decision because I don't want to have to go down that same road that my ancestors went down. Right, and so it was very interesting to me that here Baasha is, uh, and God made it clear that I lifted you up from the dust, right, to rule my people Israel. Yet you follow in the same example of Jeroboam, the same thing that you just that God allowed Baasha to kill Jeroboam for, is the same example that Baasha is putting on. And it's, and it's mind blowing because you sit here and you think, well, why in the world is it so hard to look and say, man, this king's getting destroyed, you know what I'm saying, because of the bad, the poor decisions that he's making. Why would it make sense for me to follow in the same type of, uh, the same type of example, right? What's going on, Tiff? What's going on, B? And the, the thing about it is, is... The example that Jeroboam laid out, like I said last week, it appealed to the flesh of the people, right? It, it appealed to their carnality. And in the same way, we follow our own desires because it appeals to our carnality. It appeals to our flesh. It makes us feel good. Not living um, an obedient life, not, not living a submitted life to Christ doesn't always... Um, or when we do live a submitted life to Christ, it doesn't always feel good, right? It's because it is in um, conflict with our flesh. And so uh, I thought that was very interesting just seeing this with, uh, with Baasha here. Because I'm like, man, you really got to get it together, right? But he doesn't. And it, and it really speaks to, um, to God's sovereignty because this, the succession of these kings, when one died, you know, their son came up. When the when that one when that son died, his son came up, right? And they were following right after their dad, right? But what's interesting to me is the fact that it didn't matter how many times the kingship changed, God's standard for his kings never changed. Right? So I thought it was very interesting when he calls Baasha out in verse two and says, I'm the one that put you here, right? And so it was nothing that Baasha had done that got him um that got him in that spot. It was simply because God allowed him to be there. And because God allowed him to be there, that means God is ultimately in control, right? And so if you're going to step into an office, if you're going to step into a position, if God allows you to get somewhere, understand that he has standards for your life to be put on the table, right? Because at any given moment, when you decide not to follow the standard, that position, that, um, that office, wherever that is, it can be taken from you just like that. And so it was, it was really interesting to me because what we're about to see is we're about to see all these kings get in office, but yet they're wanting to lead the people their own way. They're not wanting to follow the standards that God had already laid out. They want to follow their own standards. They want to follow their own way of doing things. And so um, it was it was really, really amazing because even... Just like God has standards back then, right, for his kings of leading, leading over the people, God has standards for us today. For us as leaders, God has standards in place for how we are to govern his people, how we are to treat his people. 
Paul admonishes um, Timothy in First and Second Timothy on what elders are supposed to look like, what deacons are supposed to look like, what pastors, preachers, all of that, right? And even just our relation as brother and sister in Christ there is a standard that is on the table for how we are to treat one another, how we are to govern one another, right? And God takes that very seriously. Whether we like the person or not, whether we agree with who that person, that person's current lifestyle or not, at the end of the day, they were all made in his image. And if they're a believer, even if they're living, if they're a believer and living an alternative lifestyle, they're not living how they should be living, they still belong to him. He is still their child, and we still have a responsibility for how we are to treat them. And so I thought that was really amazing. You can't get in, you can't deal with God's people and treat them any type of way you want to treat them, right? You can't make up your own type of rules on how you are to treat somebody, how you're supposed to speak to them, how you're supposed to lead them, or whatever. It, it's not your office. These are not your people. These are his people, right? They're his sheep. And so it's just very important for us to make sure that we're following the standard that God has laid out. And so um, let's keep let's keep moving. So again, um, verse seven says that the message from the Lord against Baasha and his family came through the prophet Jehu, son of Hanani. It was delivered because Baasha had done what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as the family of Jeroboam had done. And also because Baasha had destroyed the family of Jeroboam, the Lord's anger was provoked by Baasha's sin. And again, I, I talked about this just a second ago, kind of threw me for a loop when I read this. And here's the thing is because God said back in Exodus, in Exodus chapter 20, one of the Ten Commandments was, um, thou shalt not murder. So uh, that's exactly what Baasha did here, right? And I want to be clear that God said that he was going to destroy Jeroboam, right? He made that abundantly clear that he was going to do it. However, what I want to make clear is that he did not look, he did not look at Baasha and say, hey, I want you to go kill Jeroboam. He didn't tell him that. Scripture does not make that clear. So my point is this, is that God's not going to tell somebody to do something He's not going to tell somebody to go sin in order to accomplish his will, right? Some would, some would argue the point that God would do something like that. And based on reading this verse, some would take that and say, see, well, man, why, did, why is God holding him accountable? It's because he sinned, right? But again, it wasn't because God was forcing him. It was just a decision that Baasha made on his own. And so um, when, when you try to get so deep to understand yeah, God's sovereignty and how he does things, it'll make your head hurt, right? Because again, you can't figure him out like that. You can't, you can't pin him down and say, well, this is this and this is this. Because again, his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. We don't understand how everything works together in, his, in this realm of his sovereignty and getting things done. However, we just know that it, that it works out because he's God. He has the ability to make it happen. And so um, Baasha now is, uh, is gone. He's off the scene. And so now uh, jumping down to verse eight, his son Eli uh, is about to come up and, and rule in Israel. So let's check this out. And, and I made the statement um, before I got on that there is no stability in disobedience. And as I was looking at these, at these different timelines. If you go back to chapter 15, it states that King Asa ruled for 41 years in Judah, right? And we saw a little bit of Asa's life and how he did things. We saw that he wasn't completely devoted to the Lord, but he did make some, he did make some, um, some good decisions, right? Um, as far as turning from idol worship turning back to uh, worshiping the Lord, right? He made some good strides, some very good improvements. And so I want you to keep that in your head that Asa, that Asa ruled for 41 years consistently, right? There was no change in the office of kings in the land of Judah. But yet here, now that we are to um, Basha's, Basha's son, Eli, it says that he came to rule in the 26th year 
of Asa's reign in Judah, right? So um, Baasha came in to rule um, in, during the second year of King Asa. He ruled for 24 years, and now here's his son. So let's check this out. It says, Eli, son of Baasha, began to rule over Israel in the 26th year of King Asa's reign in Judah. He reigned in the city of Tirzah for two years. Then Zimri, who commanded half of the royal chariots, made plans to kill him. One day in Tirzah, Eli was getting drunk at the home of Arzah, the supervisor of the palace. Zimri walked in and struck him down and killed him. This happened in the 27th year of King Asa's reign in Judah. Then Zimri became the next king. Zimri immediately killed the entire royal family of Baasha, leaving him not even a single male child. He even destroyed distant relatives and friends, so Zimri destroyed the dynasty of Baasha of Baasha as the Lord had promised through the prophet Jehu. Again, God is not forcing anybody to make any decisions. It clearly says here that Zimri, who was a commander of the royal chariots, he made plans to kill Eli. Right? So this is just human behavior, right? And this is interesting because what you what we're seeing here with these kings and all these people who are killing one another is you're seeing what an undisciplined heart looks like. You're seeing what um what a life that is not um committed to following God looks like. Everybody's just doing what they want to do. It almost reminds me of of back in the time of the judges because there was no true king in Israel. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Right? Everybody wanted to have the throne. It was, a, it was a fight for power, right? Because if you're the king, you got all the power. If you're the king, you got all the authority. You can do whatever you want. You can command whatever you want. And so here it is, this power struggle going on. And now everybody's trying to take the throne. But the problem is, is that with everybody that is trying to um, usurp the throne, nobody is consulting the God who established the kingship in Israel in the first place. And that's a problem, right? Everybody's struggling to get to the throne, but nobody is wanting to consult God about how to establish the kingdom. Nobody's wanting to consult God on how should we run the kingdom? How should we govern your people? How should we do this? How should we do that? And everybody's doing what is right in their own eyes. And it just leads to a further cycle of misery. And so we're about to see six kings we're about to see, we're about to go through six kings in Israel while Asa is still the one king in Judah. And that's what I say. There is no, there is no stability in disobedience. Things are always shifting. Things are always uncertain, right? But because Asa made the decision to follow after God, we see that his, we see that his reign in Judah was longer. It was consistent. Right. There were no there were no issues. Now, I'm not saying that Asa did everything perfect. However, what he did get right, though, was following God. You've got all these other kings and we're going to keep reading about them doing what is right in their own eyes. And and they may rule for, you know, a couple of years or whatever. But immediately they're dropping like flies. And so um, let's keep moving. Let's keep moving. Uh, let's go down to verse 13. It says this happened because of all of the sins, Baasha and his son Eli had committed, and because of the sins they led Israel to commit, they provoked the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, with their uh, worthless idols. The rest of the events in Eli's reign and everything he did are recorded in the books of the history of the kings of Israel, which is the first thing that should happen as the father. Uh, 100%, 100%. And you know, what's interesting with that is, is you will consult God and ask him for wisdom when you understand that that you didn't get yourself there. You know what I'm saying? You when you understand that it's not by anything good that you did, it's because of who God was and so because God put me in this position, God, I need your wisdom on how to deal with it, right? Solomon had the right prayer at the very beginning of his life when he got ready to rule the people, which was, God, how can I rule over your people? this great number of people like this, I need your wisdom, which is the one thing that we need to be asking for on a daily basis as we interact with 
other believers, as we interact with just people in general. God, give me the wisdom on how I am to treat this person, how I am to deal with them, right? Help me be the right example so that when somebody sees me, they don't see my flesh, they don't see my carnality, because that would give you a bad rap. Let them see you so that they can be drawn to you, not to me. And so, um, and another thing, we're gonna see, we're gonna see this statement um, repeated about idols. Uh, and, you know, I, I, there's a lot of different, a lot of different talks about idols, but, you know, the thing about it is, y'all, God does not, God does not care at all about idols. God is very, um, God is very, uh, straightforward when it comes to idols. He can't stand them. He's angry when there, when anything is in place before him, he has a problem with it. He has an issue with it. And um, as, we're, as we're seeing here, these guys are getting destroyed because they're worshiping idols and they're leading God's people to worship idols, right? And I, I want to be clear about this. It, it's amazing because of what Christ has done for us. Because here's the thing. Had Christ not made the intercession that he did for us, for us to go and worship other idols, God could kill us on the spot just like that. And I'm not saying he couldn't do it now, but what I am saying is because of Jesus Christ, he doesn't see us, but he sees the sacrifice that his son made. And so um, I, I want to be clear that, yes, because of Jesus Christ, we're not experiencing God's wrath, but I don't want us to think that it's okay to put things before God because his stance on idols has not changed, right? God doesn't change. His standard doesn't change. So if he was not okay with idols back then with his people, he's still not okay with them now, no matter what it is. If it's your spouse, if it's your job, if it's um, your kids, whatever it is, God is not okay with you putting things ahead of him, right? He wants to be the number one priority in your life. And if he's not, he has an issue with it. But the beauty, the beauty is, is that he's not killing us, right? Just like he did these people back in the day. And so I'm thankful for that. But again, that doesn't give us a pass to be lazy and prioritize things over him. So I just wanted to, uh, I wanted to make that clear. And so um, I actually wanted to, I want to go over to Isaiah because I found something very beautiful in Isaiah dealing with this, this whole issue of, of idols. Uh, and it's in Isaiah chapter 44. And we, I won't read, I won't read all of it, but I do encourage you to, um, to go check it out. So, so let's jump down here. Uh, so God's dealing with people who make these idols out of wood and out of, uh, out of metal and all of this stuff because back then a lot of the idols were made out of wood. They were forged out of, out of the metals by blacksmiths and all of this stuff. And so uh, let's jump down to... Let's go down to verse... 15, 14, it says, he cuts down cedars, he selects the cypress and the oak. He plants the pine in the forest to be nourished by the rain. Then he uses part of the wood to make a fire. With it, he warms himself and bakes his bread. Then yes, it's true, he takes the rest of it and makes himself a God to worship. He makes an idol and bows down in front of it. He burns part of the tree to roast his meat and to keep himself warm. He says, ah, the f that fire feels good. Then he takes what's left and makes his God a carved idol. He falls down in front of it, worshiping and praying to it. Rescue me, he says, you are my God. Uh, it says such stupidity and ignorance. Their eyes are closed and they cannot see. Their minds are shut and they cannot think. The person who made the idol never stops to reflect why it is just a block of wood. I burned half of it for heat and used it to make and used it to bake my bread and roast my meat. How can the rest of it be a God? Should I bow down to worship a piece of wood? It says the poor deluded fool feeds on ashes. He trusts something that can't help him at all. Yet he cannot bring himself to ask, is this idol that I'm holding in my hand a lie? And God is just being clear that people who worship idols are so deluded in their thinking. They think that this, the idol that they are, that has grabbed their attention so is something that can really help them when, at, when all the while it can't do anything for them at all. 
Israel fell into this, this lie, this deception of following these worthless idols, right? Listening to um, the pagan nations, listening to their neighbors saying, man, this guy's doing this, this guy's doing this. And so they fall into this trap and now they're worshiping these false idols who can do absolutely nothing for them. And God makes it clear um, all throughout scripture when dealing with this is that there would be a time when um, Israel would, would cry out and say, God, save us. And his response to them was, go pray to your idols, right? Go pray to the thing that has grabbed your attention so much that you forgot about me. Go ask that idol to save you. And so what I'm saying is, ladies and gentlemen, is that sometimes we can be so guilty of placing our faith, our trust, our hope in people, in things that can't do anything for us, right? And it is the trick of the enemy to get us into thinking that the job, the spouse, the kids, whatever, those things can be to us what only God can be to us, right? And so um, don't, don't fall for the trap of, of placing things um, in, in a higher priority than you do God, right? Because we, we, have, to, we have to stay um, with the understanding of he's the creator of all things, right? We're the creation. Everything is subject to him, right? There's absolutely nothing that is not subject to who he is. Um, and even, even for me, and I don't mind sharing, um, you know, for me, I struggled with, uh, placing so much emphasis on my job as the source of my provision, right? As my bank account being the source of my provision. But what do you do when the bank account or when the job isn't available anymore? You know what I'm saying, what do you do then? How, where, where does the help come from, right? If the thing that you were trusting in, this idol you were trusting in, if it's all of a sudden gone, it can't do anything for you, then, then where does your help come from? Where does your provision come from then, right? And I had to learn how to depend on him, how to understand that he was the ultimate source. My job was just a resource. And now that the understanding has shifted, I've seen moments, right? When people are, are being laid off from the job, when a plant that I'm working on has been completely shut down and I don't know where I'm going to go next, yet God opens a door for me to go and work somewhere else, right? Even when the accident happened, God allowed it to be so that everything worked out with my job, that I had um, benefits and all of this stuff that were able to carry me and my family through, but it wasn't the job, it was God allowing it to happen. And so I say that to say, don't get caught up in the in the in the materialistic things. Don't get caught up in um, in these these small worthless idols, right? But keep your focus on the God who is over everything. And that was what um, these people of Israel. That's what they were failing to do. It's what these kings were failing to do. Um, they they always thought that it was in some type of relic, right? Um, that this is what this is what brought salvation. This is what made things happen in your life, right? And it was absolutely none of that. It was simply God. And so uh, let's keep let's keep moving. So let's jump down to verse 15. And so now um, Zimri is beginning to take over and rule in Israel. It says, Zimri began to rule over Israel in the 27th year of King Asa's reign. See, again, we, we're changing kingship over here in Israel, yet over here in Judah, it's the same king, right? So it says, 27th year of Asa's reign in Judah, but his reign in Tirzah lasted only seven days. Wow. So we went from 24 years to two years. Now we're down to seven days. That's as long as your rule is lasting. It's seven days. It says the army of Israel was then attacking the Philistine town of Gibe, uh, Gibbethon when they heard that Zimri had committed treason and had assassinated the king that very day, they chose Omri, commander of the army, as the new king of Israel. So Omri led the entire army of Israel up from Gibbethon to attack Tirzah, Israel's capital. So now, now Israel within itself is beginning to be divided because of what Zimri did. Zimri kills Elah, right? Part of Baish's family, which is thus fulfilling scripture. Brenton talked about that on Thursday. If you missed that, go back and check it out. Um, but at the same time, now Israel's being divided and now Zimri is about to kill himself. So it says, 
When Zimri saw that the city had been taken, he went into the citadel of the palace and burned it down over himself and died in the flames, for he too had done what was evil in the Lord's sight. He followed the example of Jeroboam in all the sins he had committed and led Israel to commit. The rest of the events of Zimri's reign and his conspiracy, they're all found in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. So you, we're seeing this pattern, ladies and gentlemen, that in Judah, you have a king that's being obedient. In Israel, we have kings doing whatever they want to do, and their reign is not lasting, right? They're following in these evil examples of Jeroboam, and it's not working out very well for them at all. So now we've went through Baasha, Elah, and Zimri. So now here we are to Omri, right? Now Omri is taking over, and he's about to, he's about to reign, right? And so what's happening here is that God is allowing the dynasty of David to continue while destroying the, the dynasties of these wicked kings over here. But I want to be clear about this, is that God's not being unfair, okay? God's not being unjust. God is giving everybody the same opportunity to make the right decision, right? He's given every man, all these kings, whether they're in Israel, whether they're in Judah, right? The standard for the king over God's people is found in Deuteronomy chapter 17. This is what the king is supposed to abide by. It doesn't matter if you're in Judah or in Israel, right? This is my standard, okay? And in the same way, just as he had a standard then, he has a standard now, right? There will, there will, ne nobody will ever be able to say that, um, that God's hand was not extended to them, right? At the end of their life, they'll never be able to say, well, I, 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 I didn't know. I didn't get the same opportunity, right? That this person got to make the right decision. No, he gives everybody the same opportunity to make the right decision. And now that right decision, first initial decision is choosing his son, Jesus Christ, right? Everybody has the opportunity to do that. And if you, if you don't take that opportunity, then at the end of your life, well, you get what you get, which is eternal separation from him. But it's not because the opportunity was not there. It's because you didn't make the decision that you needed to make. And so um, really, really amazing here because again, all these kings, right? Same opportunity, but it's all about the decision that you make. And so um, what's interesting is when Asa died in, in chapter 15, he died because it said his feet became diseased and then he died. What's happening with these guys here is they're dying because of disobedience. God is allowing situations to unfold in their lives. The, the predecessors are killing, are killing the successors and all of this stuff. He's allowing um, different kings to come in and do this and do that. But it's because of their disobedience. It's because of them not wanting to follow the standard that God had laid out. And so um, it, it's, a, it's really funny because one man's obedience, David's obedience, allowed for one of his descendants to always be on the throne. Always. Because if you go back to chapter 15, um, verse 3, when Abijam starts ruling, it says he committed the same sins as his father before him, and he was not faithful to the Lord his God as his ancestor had, David had been. Verse 4 says this, but for David's sake, the Lord his God allowed his descendants to continue ruling, shining like a lamp, and he gave Abijam a son to rule after him in Jerusalem. For David had done what was pleasing in the Lord's sight and had obeyed the Lord's command throughout his life, except in the affair, the affair concerning Uriah the Hittite. So David's dynasty gets to continue because of David's obedience, right? So despite their sins. Now for us, because of Christ's obedience, despite our sins, we still get to stay in the family. We still get to remain a part of the family. God's not casting us out. God's not killing us. God's not throwing us away. He's not throwing us out of the family, right? Because if you go to Ephesians chapter one, it talks about we were adopted, right? Into the family through Jesus Christ. And so I thought that that was really amazing because David had some half obedience, right? Some partial obedience, but Christ was completely obedient. Philippians chapter two, verse eight says that he was completely obedient all the way up to even death on a cross, right? And so now because of Christ's obedience, 
we get to remain in the family despite our sins, despite our shortcomings, despite the moments where we're not faithful to God, despite the moments when we may prioritize things over him, we may place people over him, we may do our own thing, right? But because of the sake of his son, right? Because of what Christ did on the cross for us, it covers the multitude of our sins. And I thought that that was really, um, really, really amazing because again, God's allowing David's dynasty to continue because of ultimately who's coming, which is Christ, the Messiah. And so uh, I thought that was a very um, encouraging moment um, for us tonight. So let's, let's keep moving. Verse 21, it says, but now the people of Israel were split into two factions. Half the people tried to take Tibni, son of Ganath, their king, while the other half supported Omri. But Omri's supporters defeated the supporters of Tibni. So Tibni was killed and Omri became the next king. Omri began to rule over Israel in the 31st year of King Asa's reign in Judah. He reigned 12 years in all, six of them in Tirzah. Then Omri brought, bought the hill now known as Samaria from its owner Shamir for 150 pounds of silver. He built a city on it and called the city Samaria in honor of Shamir. Verse 25, here it, here it is again. But Omri did what was evil in the Lord's sight, even more than any of the kings before him. He followed the example of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and all the sins he had committed and led Israel to commit. The people provoked the anger of the Lord the God of Israel with their worthless idols. So there it is again, y'all. Anything that you place ahead of God is worthless, right? It can't do anything for you and God deems it as worthless, okay? Um, so again, just reiterating the point. And, you know, as I'm reading this and I ask myself the question, well, why does God keep repeating this? Why does he keep, why does he keep bringing up worthless idols? Why does he keep bringing this up? And, you know, when you think about a parent, right, there are often times that you have to continually, continually repeat the same thing over and over to your child. Sometimes for me, it's exhausting. However, I, I've, I have noticed that certain things I don't have to repeat anymore, right? Because I've said it so many times that it has finally clicked in my son's head, right? And so now he understands. He has an understanding. So when I say it the first time, Right. He understands, OK, this is what I need to be doing. Right. This is how I'm supposed to do this. This is how I'm supposed to do this. And, and it's really it's really amazing to me because. We have to see that with God as well. Right. Is that he simply is repeating things over and over and over. And for us at surface value, it may say, man, this is really redundant. No, God wants you to get an understanding. God wants it to really sink in. Right. He really wants you to understand how worthless idols are, right? He really wants you to understand how he, how he views these things, right? And it helps you, it helps you to understand, it helps you to, to understand him better. And so uh, let's see here. Okay, cool. And um, another thing that I found interesting about these kings is that these guys that aren't doing right, right? Their, their reigns are not lasting very long, but yet in Judah, there is um, Asa's, Asa's um, rule is continually going on, right? And what's interesting to me is that God cares about all of his people. And so as I'm, as I'm reading this and studying this chapter, one thing that came to my mind is just that, that of a loving father, right? He always wanted somebody in place over his people that would lead them in the right direction. And so that was really, really interesting to me um, because he loves his people so much. He's not just going to let them um, stay under the rule of an evil king. Now, again, their decisions will push them into exile, but we'll get to that later on. But just to see how the, he's not allowing these corrupt kings to stay in place for very long. I was like, wow, that's that's really a loving father. Right. He wants the best for his kids. And so like he told him way back then, if you get a king, he's got to follow this. Right, not because God's trying to put all these rules and regulations out, but God cares about His kids. If you don't want me directly, at least the person that that you got that I allow to be in place over you, he needs to he needs to resemble me, right? So you guys can see me through your king. I thought that was that was interesting. So um, let's keep 
let's keep moving and then we will be we will be out of here so let's jump down to verse 29 it says ahab son of omri began to rule in israel in the 38th year of king asa's reign in judah so we are king number six it says he reigned in samaria 22 years but ahab son of omri did what was evil in the lord's sight even more than any of the kings before him this cycle of of uh, disobedience just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger it says and as though it were not enough to follow the sinful example of jeroboam so it's not enough that you are allowing idol worship to continue right now it says he married jezebel the daughter of king ethbaal of the sidonians which the sidonians god talked about them way a long time ago these people are part of the canaanite culture so not only are you adopting um, false worship now you're intermarrying with people that i said my people should not intermarry with at all right so king ahab is really stacking this up for himself so it says and he began to bow down in worship of baal first ahab built a temple and an altar for baal in samaria then he set up an asherah pole he did more to provoke the anger of the lord the God of Israel than any of the other kings of Israel before him. And, you know, this is this is interesting because of what Jeroboam started and what Jeroboam started when he was trying to. And we talked about it when he was trying to keep the people together. Right. He promoted this false worship to begin to happen. And so he began to put distance between the people and God. Right. Distance between the fellowship, between the people and God. And when that happens, you leave people to their own devices, right? People start creating their own ways to worship. They start creating their own lifestyles. They start creating their own rules, their own standards for themselves. And so uh, my encouragement is to make sure that there's nothing that is distancing you from fellowshipping with the Father, right? And we understand that when we fall short, when we sin, those things, they, have, they can interrupt the fellowship. So repent, confess get it right and get back in fellowship, right? Because you don't want to be in a place where you are away from him for so long, right? That you start coming up with your own ideas. You start listening to your own thinking and you're not being influenced by the power of the Holy Spirit. You're being influenced by your, your own carnality as well as the influence of the enemy. So that's why it's important to stay in constant, constant fellowship with the Lord. And so Ahab here, He's just continuing to perpetuate this foolery um, that's going on. And we're going to deal with Ahab a little later on this week. And so he'll actually be one of the main kings that we focus on um, as we continue to get out of this book. So verse 34, um, this, this is really interesting because uh, let me read it and then I'll make my point and then we'll be out of here. It says, it was during his reign that he ill, a man from Bethel, rebuilt Jericho. When he laid its foundations, it cost him the life of his oldest son, Abiram. And when he completed it and set up its gates, it cost him the life of his youngest son, Segub. Uh, this all happened according to the message from the Lord concerning Jericho, spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. So let's flip back to Joshua real quick, because I love when the Bible uh, just continually proves itself to be true. It says, um, verse 24 of chapter 6 of Joshua, it says, Then the Israelites burned the town and everything in it. Only the things made from silver, gold, bronze, or iron were kept for the treasury of the Lord's house. So Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute and her relatives who were with her in the house. Because she had hidden the spies, Joshua sent to Jericho, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. At that time, here comes the message. It says, Joshua invoked this curse. May the curse of the Lord fall on anyone who tries to rebuild the town of Jericho at the cost of his firstborn son, he will lay its foundation. At the cost of his youngest son, he will set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua and his reputation spread throughout the land. So it had been hundreds of years since this, since Joshua invoked this curse, right? And so now here we are in 1 Kings chapter 16 and verse 34. 
Now in the reign of Ahab, this cat heel decides that he wants to rebuild Jericho. And now it cost him the life of his oldest son and the life of his youngest son. And I, and I make that point to say this, is that when God says something, it doesn't matter how long of a time gap is in between it. It doesn't matter if it's one year, if it's 50 years, if it's 300 years, it doesn't matter. Know this, that when he says it, it will come to pass, right? When the conditions are met in which he made the, the, the curse, the promise or the proclamation, whatever those conditions were around that, when those conditions are met, no matter what the timestamp is, it will come to pass. And I thought that that was really, really, really interesting. And, and again, for me, it just places the emphasis on making sure that we are sharing the truths of God's word, right? Don't just share the, don't just share the good stuff, right? But share, share it all. Share all of the truth because the entire Bible is truth, right? And so everything that pertains to these scriptures, we need to be talking about so that no one can be, no one will be um, unlearned. Nobody will be um, ignorant of things that go on, things that happen, right? They'll always be able to tie it back to scripture. And now that they're informed, they'll make better decisions, right? But even God said that my people perish for a lack of knowledge, right? So let's make sure that we are sharing with people, right? So that people have the understanding they need to make the right decisions and avoid the even the bad promises, right? Because you hear Brenton reference um, Deuteronomy 28 all the time. We like to, we love to talk about the fact that I'm the head, I'm not the tail, I'm blessed in the city, I am blessed in the field, blessed when I come, blessed when I go. We love to claim all that, but we skip over Deuteronomy chapter 28 that deals with when we sin or when we do something, right? When we do something wrong and then God's discipline comes and we're like all out in left field saying, Lord, where did this come from? Well, it's in the book. So make sure you're reading it all and you're not just focusing on the high points, but make sure that you're absorbing all of it so that you can be well informed on the decisions that you need to make. And so to see this come to pass several hundred years later it is amazing because again, it just continues to solidify the fact that God is a God of his word and it never changes, right? With us, we can make vows and get all flipping. You know what I'm saying? We'll sign a, we'll sign a, a, a contract on a car thinking everything's cool. And then the first time something ain't good, you know what I'm saying? Or the, or the bank account's a little short. We'll skip a payment. We'll, uh, we'll allow him to repossess the car. We will renege on the, on the loan we made, all of that stuff, right? We're inconsistent like that. However, God is not. So just understand when he says it, he means it, it's going to happen. So um, guys, that is 1 Kings chapter 16. I appreciate y'all for coming on this evening. Um, tomorrow, Angela and Brenton will be on doing um, chapter 17. Wednesday, me and Marcus will be on um, doing chapter 18. And then Brenton will be on on Thursday in chapter 19. So I, I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you guys to continue to stay with us. Continue to invest um, outside of this, outside of the, the sessions here. Um, read it for yourself, right? Um, get an understanding for yourself. Um, don't just take what we're saying at face value. Go back and research it, right? Um, because that's what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to just take everything at face value. Go back, check it for yourself, right? Get your own understanding, right? And so we're just here to, to put the truth out there, but we want everybody to grow, right, um, on their own. So... Uh, we love you guys and we appreciate y'all. Let's pray. Uh, Father, how we love you, how we thank you. Uh, God, I thank you because you're consistent. I thank you because your word is always true. Um, you are the one person that can be trusted in any situation at any time, um, no matter what is going on. God, um, there there is a lot in the world that, uh, that claims to be the truth, that claims that... Um, claims that we can rely on, we can put our faith in, put our trust in, but God, you are the only source. Your word is the only source, God, that we can that we can stand upon in confidence knowing that it will hold, that it will be um, that it will be true. God, your word says that the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And God, I thank you for that. I thank you that you can be trusted. 
uh, Lord. And I pray tonight, God, that your word will uh, penetrate our hearts. God, help us to not to try to understand your word logically with our minds. God, because there are things that go on in your word, uh, things that you do that don't make sense to um, our human mind. But God, I pray that our hearts are open. Um, God, as your truth is being revealed Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays. God, I pray that um, we're, we're able to soak it up and to grow. God, I pray that you would continue to help us grow um, in you, continue to help us to pursue you. God, if there's idols in our lives, I pray, Lord, that you help us to have the same um, the same viewpoint on idols that you do, God, and to, to cast down their idols, God, and to put you back in a proper place uh, where you belong. Father, I thank you for uh, sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us, that even when we do mess up, because of the sacrifice he made, God, you still allow us to be a part of the family. You still call us sons. You still call us daughters. And so, Father, I thank you for that. I thank you that when you look at me, you don't see Aaron, but God, you see the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you. We praise you. And we uh, we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Again, you guys um, have a great evening. We will see y'all tomorrow. And on the other side of success, I'm out.